And now it's time for the final world of the game. Greetings, I'm Solid Scully, and I bet you're all getting sick of Kingdom Hearts, but don't worry. We are very much in endgame territory right now as we go to the final world. Not to be confused with the final world from Kingdom Hearts 3, but instead the final world. Which is to say, the end of the world. As we know it, and I don't feel fine, because I'm freezing my butt off! Anyway, enough joking about, this is pretty much our final gummy ship segment. Uh, definitely one of the hardest ones for the amount of length that you're gonna have to go through, but, uh... Well, yeah, it kind of justifies it with the thematics here. There is no light to protect you. Yeah, like, I mean, you can really get the impression that the darkness is slowly taking hold of the world, and, uh... Well, I mean, the only thing we have left is the vestige of the one world that, uh, may seem a bit familiar. But alas, uh, again, like, in terms of how you can progress in the game with a gummy ship and all that, normally I would recommend going with, uh, one of the custom builds you can get from Geppetto and, uh, Sid, but... Honestly, uh, I, and again, I guess I kind of surprised myself in this instance, but yeah, you can pretty much get through all of this with the base gummy ship, so, uh, I really don't know what to say. Pretty sure it won't be the case in Kingdom Hearts 2, since that has, uh, well, a little bit more action-packed and, uh, slightly more difficult gummy ship segments to go along if you're trying to use the base ship, but you know what, I'm curious, I'm gonna try and stick with the base ship. I mean, I was able to do it for this game, I was able to do it in Kingdom Hearts 3, so, uh, I'm determined, damn it. But yeah, this is pretty much them throwing all the stops at you, and uh, unlike every other gummy ship segment in the game, this does have a lot more involvement from the player to basically just keep on the move and uh, keep on shooting, keep on dodging, and uh, depending on what sort of upgrades you have to your ship, just, uh, well, use them to your own expense. I mean, you can get better shields, you can get thrusters, basically the whole shebang, really. Oh, that and the fact that the Heartless are actually attacking you is, uh, you know, nice, I suppose. Oh, in terms of anything else, however, I will say that the end of the world segment of Kingdom Hearts is by far one of my favorite levels. Honestly, in the entire series, not the favorite, but definitely one of them. Just... Well, I mean, if only for its atmosphere alone. Like, I mean, not just for what we're seeing here, but for what we're eventually going to be discovering once we, you know, get to the world itself. But alas, more Heartless need to be destroyed before we can get to the final part. And, uh... Actually, you know what, I think I might save that for when we actually get to the world itself, because, uh, as we can see here, this giant nebula that looks like an exploded planet with its core ripped out, that's pretty much all the hints I'm going to be giving you about this place. But, uh, in the meantime, enjoy the cutscene. Is that all that's left of the worlds taken by the Heartless? Those worlds will be restored if we beat Ansem, right? You betcha! But if we do beat him, and all these worlds become restored and disconnected, what's gonna happen to this place? And to us? Well, uh... This is a Heartless world, so maybe it'll just disappear. Huh? But no worries. Even if this place goes poof, our hearts ain't going nowhere. I'm sure we'll find our pals again. Yep, I just know that we will. <laughs> yep. Yeah, you're right. I'll return this. I promise. Van Earth to return. Now, uh, the reason why you're pretty much going to be uh, seeing a sort of jump cut right here is because... Well, basically, in order to unlock the uh, superior um, super boss, you basically need to uh, watch the first cutscene after you get to the end of the world, then go back, and then go back to Hollow Bastion in order to uh, well, trigger the super boss. Which is part of the reason why I was kind of doing things a little bit out of order. So again, if in your own Kingdom Hearts playthrough you're wondering how to unlock the superior super boss, then well, uh, this is how you do it: go to the end of the world first, then go back and return to Hollow Bastion, and Bob's your uncle, really. And, uh, well, in terms of how End of the World works, in terms of its structure, basically, you're gonna be fighting through hell, and, well, traversing through hell, really. This is about as close as Kingdom Hearts really gets towards having a very foreboding, uh, dark hellscape kind of stage, and, uh, honest to goodness, it works really well. Like, I mean, if I can compare it to anything, it's kinda like, uh, hell in Doom 3, 
You know, mainly in terms of the atmosphere, where you're in this really bizarre, dark, interdimensional place that just feels like a mishmash of several different environments. But all the same, it just keeps this very oppressive and dreary atmosphere of... This is what's gonna happen to, well, the rest of the universe if you don't hurry your butt up and put a stop to Ansem's Seeker of Darkness. And again, as you'd expect, there are a lot of tricks and traps. You get some pretty good rewards for whatever treasure chest you try and pick up. And I believe the drop rates from specific Heartless in this world are also pretty, uh... Well, at least a lot more frequent than what you get in many other worlds in the game, so... Yeah, if you want to uh, mine for some synthesis materials, this is the place for you. Uh, then I suppose, well, a bit of a catch-22 really, but again, if you want to get some pretty decent, if rare, drops, well, this is the place to get them rather than uh, buying them or, you know, wasting your time to do the other extraneous shit if you're not one for, you know, getting invested and stuff like that. I mean, I, w I mean, at this point you are at the end of the game anyway, so not like it really matters, but... I mean, if you're focusing on that, why not? And of course, we have yet another boss fight against the Behemoth. Now in that really cool blue flame thing. It's like the brother of the the orange flame behemoth. He got, he got one t-shirt and this one got the other. Really cool design, but at the same time though, the behemoth isn't really a very dangerous boss, so uh, eh, just go to town on it. And plus its health I don't think is quite as large as the one that we fought in the uh, Holy Bastion keyhole, so yeah, that's pretty much it. I gotta say, I really love the music here as well, absolutely the battle theme, like, I mean, it's a reprise of the, uh, Distati theme that we heard at the beginning of the game, but... I don't know, there's a really cool, uh, twist on it. Like, I mean, both in battle and out of battle. Uh, the out of battle music that you're hearing right here, again, uh, different from the one on the soundtrack, actually, it actually has a heartbeat. Uh, yeah. So, like, I mean, you're literally traveling across the destroyed heart of the world, and that's... I don't know, it's just those little details that add an extra little bit of, uh creep factor to it. It's like, this is a dead world that's desperately trying to beat itself. Well, desperately trying to beat itself back into life, really, and again, it's cool. And I suppose to talk about the battle theme in and of itself is that, well, again, we pretty much got a long stretch of menu here, so fuck it. But yeah, in terms of the battle theme, it's a reprise once again of the, uh, the battle theme we heard in the Station of Awakening, but at the same time, it's got like this... I don't know, like, it's got this real fight with all your heart because this is the end of the world and God damn, if you don't, we're all screwed. I don't know, I could gush for hours about this level and, uh, well, once again, while well, we're staring at item management, the game is also to do with the visuals that we're seeing here. Again, sparse bits of land, an open body of water, and, well, some shining islands at the end of the world. That's, uh, pretty much all the hints I'm gonna give you as to what this place truly is, but, again, it is fucking beautiful imagery. Like, I mean, you are literally standing on the precipice between life and death, and... God damn, you get to see so much about what has been swallowed by the darkness, and basically all the remnants left behind that are slowly being consumed. I don't know, it's just so much... It's just so cool, man. Uh, but again, I suppose to talk about more, uh, specific gameplay things, well, again, you might think that given how open, uh, this world looks, that, you know, navigating it might be a bit impossible, but again, you're pretty much navigating across an invisible pathway. So again, like, I mean, even though it looks open, you are pretty much being guided through invisible walls to basically zigzag between uh, the treasure chest. Some of which are booby-trapped, as you can see here, by the fact that we're constantly being bombarded by the, uh, uh the invisibles and the, uh, oh, shit, I f the Angel Heartless, I believe? I forgot what their official name was, but, uh, basically they're the ones that give you Gale. Which is, a uh, synthesis material that you need. And again, this is pretty much where you're supposed to encounter the uh, Invisibles, but you got a brief taste of them earlier uh, with the Hades Cup of the Olympus Colosseum. And of course, because it's, you know, we got to force in that Kingdom Hearts 2 connection, we're going to be breaking out Mushu, who uh, wasn't quite as useful here as I thought. Oh god, I love this so much, it is so cool, and I need it to live. Kind of a shame we couldn't really explore this little area since it's pretty much set up like a Final Fantasy ban- uh, a Final Fantasy battle arena, I was gonna call it a battery arena, but that ain't make no sense! And what again, if you've pretty much got any leftover elixirs or mega elixirs or whatever, uh, saved over from the super bosses, this is pretty much the time to use them because you probably won't use them anywhere else. Uh, but again, I suppose that would possibly come from, you know, extended playthrough experience or unless of course you're that greedy and need the full restore right then and there. 
Because, I mean, in some cases, it gets to sort of end up in, like, a BFG situation where, like, you have this powerful weapon or, like, really powerful healing items, but you don't end up using them until, like, either right at the end of the game or you still have them saved up and you basically just don't end up using them because, well, you're in that sort of conservative mindset, so... <clears throat> I, don't really, I don't really know... <coughs> Excuse me. I don't really know what to say. Like, I mean, it's uh, just one of those weird video game things. But anyway, because I'm a greedy fuck, let's go after all the treasure chests. Uh, like, uh, darkness explosions be damned. And now I'm pretty much watching this in telesnap tele vision. Jesus. But yeah. Like, I mean, I'm pretty much going to be dividing the, uh, the end of the world segments into two uh, specific videos. The first of which will basically be to go through, you know, the general areas, the second of which will be to, uh, we'll attack with some of the more interesting parts of, of the End of the World segment. Because, I mean, as we're seeing here, like, I mean, there is, you know, the general destruction, but there is also a very, uh, otherworldly quality to the End of the World that just makes me smile so much, and it's the sort of feeling that I don't think the Kingdom Hearts series has captured before or since, and if nothing else, I suppose also accounts to the reasons why I happen to like Kingdom Hearts 1 for its unique atmosphere. I don't know, there's just a way it seems to meld this otherworldly quality with, you know, the Final Fantasy and Disney stuff. Whereas a lot of later Kingdom Hearts games usually tend to either go full on one or the other, like it's either completely anime or Disney-esque, and... I don't know, there really is something to be said about how Kingdom Hearts 1 hit a nice balance between all three of these elements and just... succeeds. Then again, I suppose this is also mainly due to a lot of Tetsuya Nomura's uh, very interpretive influences, at least in terms of the way he wants people to feel about, you know, specific story decisions or uh, the atmosphere that plays out in some of his uh, directorial games, so... Again, I don't really know what to say for certain, but look at this. Well, okay, not necessarily the uh, darkness thing, but at the very least that, uh, those few pillars of light and, uh, the stones. It's... Again, like, I mean, if there's one I can say about the end of the world, it's artistry is just... It's unmatched, man, and I fucking love it. And of course, we're pretty much just gonna be making the most out of our use of the uh, Trinity. Because we have our friends. And I suppose even to talk about the earlier cutscene as well, actually, in terms of how uh, Sora Tunnel and Goofy are in fact the best Trinity. Trinity? Trinity? The little Trinity? Again, it's just... I don't know, the foreboding atmosphere combined with the, uh, I guess, chumminess by the end of all this. It's fucking beautiful, man. And speaking of beautiful, take a look at this. A huge canyon filled to the brim with gummy blocks. And again, if you will remember the Ansem reports, which uh, you should be watching, or at least by the time this video is uploaded, yeah. This is pretty much where they come from. Pieces from destroyed worlds, and uh, this canyon's full of them. Like, I mean, I suppose if you wanted to get some pieces to upgrade the ship, not that you'd really need to, unless of course you wanted to go for some of the optional challenges, then feel free, but... Again, it is... It, it's incredibly cool. And again, to further comment on the level design, there are a bunch of hidden treasures and, you know, all that kind of stuff hidden around, so... Again, feel free to just explore around, collect some stuff, and... You know, have at it, man. Okay. Uh, not that you'll probably see that due to the editing, but, uh... I had a sudden bowel movement, but don't worry, I am now back because I've evacuated the darkness from the bowels of my... Bowels? And it came out of the end of my world! Jesus Christ, this playthrough has been fucking raw- <laughs> fucking raunchy as hell. Oh, God. I mean, just sing it back down to, like, this entire journey. I started this in March, and now it's been fucking... Uh, well, I mean, at the time of recording, it's fucking September now, so, uh... Yeah, you probably won't be seeing this until... Um... <clears throat> God, depending on how things go, probably November, I think. Uh... You know, depending on whether or not I decide to cut things down for... You know, Co-Veronica and Silent Hill 2 to run alongside it, so, uh... Hmm... This playthrough went on for fucking years, and it was raunchy as fuck. From getting drunk to naming the boat the SS Futa Lover, from making many, many dark jokes, that really isn't my usual style of humor. But I guess maybe the darkness has corrupted me. Yeah, whatever. It's, it, it's been fun. Like, I mean, I know this playthrough probably hasn't been viewed by many people, or has probably been desperately clutching at themselves wanting for it to end, but... Again, I love Kingdom Hearts, in spite of its, in spite of its very weird qualities, but, like, it's a series I still enjoy, which is more than I can say for some that have dimmed significantly in my eyes, but, whatever. 
Again, there are actually very specific ways to navigate around. I believe this is actually one of the few times when you can use the, uh... Uh, the Batman shimmy mechanic, where you can just slowly go across ledges, but, uh... Otherwise, you can kind of, uh, MacGyver your way across using this, and you do have occasional, like, uh, webbed nets to climb around, so... Yeah, nothing too bad. And plus, you know, with a glide ability, you pretty much have free reign to ascend and descend as much as you want, except in cases like this, where you just sink down below. Which sucks. Uh, let's see, I've also got a bit of trivia, not sh um... Yeah, you know what, fuck it, I will mention it, because uh, there were three uh, planned final boss fights. Uh, one of which you're going to be seeing at the very final part of the game. Uh, another of which, which was, um, I think, done at a very early time in Kingdom Hearts development stage. And, of course, the one that I'm going to be talking to you about here, because I think I might save the other two for the next part. But, yeah, in terms of a little uh, out-of-bounds secret that I believe is still in the game files in both Final Mix and Kingdom Hearts 1... Yeah, initially you were going to be fighting the ants and possessed Riku one last time on basically a crumbled version of Destiny Islands, which, again, as you can probably tell with all the uh, symbolism here, yeah, that's what this place is meant to be, intertwining Destiny Islands with the, well, Realm of Darkness, which it is slowly sinking into. And I suppose also to talk about that a little bit more, there is actually a way to access it, I believe. I think it might be on, like, on the first screen, where you, if you go a little bit above and beyond the, uh, the light pillars, you can see, like, these darkness waterfalls in an area that I think is meant to resemble, you know, just outside the secret place where, you know, you would afford, uh, Walker or Selfie. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if there's any coding for it, but the area itself is still in the game, but, yeah. <clears throat> in terms of anything else, actually, I forgot what I was gonna say because I had something else in the brain and it didn't quite work. Oh, now I remember what it was. It was also to do with basically some... Uh, trivia slash retconny things slash, uh, well, the rest of the series trying to jam itself together thanks to Birth by Sleep, of course, but this time not the Birth by Sleep you're thinking of. Uh, basically the Fragmentary Passage. Actually, no, was it Fragmentary Passage? Or, yeah, I think it was. Uh, basically a prequel to Kingdom Hearts 3 that got cut out on the cutting room floor that takes place actually right now. Like, I mean, as Sora's fighting the Heartless here, basically, well, characters from Birth by Sleep are in the Realm of Darkness, well, basically helping the king grab a keyblade. And of course, Riku is a part of those events, but of course, since he has to be here in Kingdom Hearts 1, naturally, uh, he pretty much stays very far away from, well, everything else. So, uh, yeah, things are cooking. I was actually... I was actually partially debating on whether or not I would actually intertwine a Birth by Sleep a Fragmentary Passage into this, but I thought, you know what, well, let's experience the games, you know, in release order. Although, then again, <laughs> thinking about that, yeah, I'm not really, really sure what I'm going to be doing next. It's either going to be Kingdom Hearts 2, or I'm going to try and do something with Days, but I I'm really not too sure at this point. <clears throat> anyway, I mean, if you wanted to ignore, like, getting all this treasure chest shit or, you know, ambushing the Heartless, you can pretty much just go down to that little uh, whirlpool vortex over, thing, over there, and you can pretty much just go on your merry way, really. But I mean, that does mean skipping this lovely crystalline gummy block area, which would be doing the art designers a great disservice. So, always respect the artist's work, or they will kill you, and paint a picture with your blood and organs and stuff. But anyway, I'm Solid Skelly, keep a new metal, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye <laughs>